Book Demon Copperhead by Barbara Kingsolver Epigraph It's in vain to recall the past, unless it works some influence upon the present. Charles Dickens, David Copperfield Contents one first, I got myself born. A decent crowd was on hand to watch, and they've always given me that much. The worst of the job was up to me, my mother being, let's just say, out of it. On any other day, they'd have seen her outside on the deck of her trailer home, good neighbors taking notice, pestering the tit of trouble as they will. All through the dog-breath air of late summer and fall, cast an eye up the mountain, and there she'd be, little bleach blonde smoking her palm malls, hanging on that railing like she's captain of her ship up there, and now might be the hour it's going down. This is an 18-year-old girl we're discussing, all on her own and as pregnant as it gets. The day she failed to show, it fell to Nance Peggett to go bang on the door, barge inside, and find her passed out on the bathroom floor with her junk all over the place, and me already coming out. A slick, fish-colored hostage picking up grit from the vinyl tile, worming and shoving around because I'm still inside the sack that babies float in, pre-real life. Mr. Peggett was outside idling his truck, headed for evening service, probably thinking about how much of his life he'd spent waiting on women. His wife would have told him the jesus could hold on a minute. First, she needed to go see if the little pregnant gal had got herself liquored up again. Mrs. Peggett, being a lady that doesn't beat around the bushes, and if need be, will tell Christ Jesus to sit tight and keep his pretty hair on. She came back out yelling for him to call 911 because a poor child is in the bathroom trying to punch himself out of a bag. Like a little blue prize fighter. Those are the words she'd use later on, being not at all shy to discuss the worst day of my mom's life. And if that's how I came across to the first people that laid eyes on me, I'll take it. To me, that says I had a fighting chance. Long odds, yes, I know. If a mother is lying in her own piss and pill bottles while they're slapping the kid she shunted out, telling him to look alive, likely the bastard is doomed. Kid born to the junkie is a junkie. He'll grow up to be everything you don't want to know. The rotten teeth and dead zone eyes. The nuisance of locking up your tools in the garage so they don't walk off. The rent-by-the-week motel squatting well back from the scenic highway. This kid, if he wanted a shot at the finer things, should have got himself delivered to some rich or smart or Christian non-using type of mother. Anybody will tell you the born of this world are marked from the get-out, win or lose. Me, though, I was a born sucker for the superhero rescue. Did that line of work even exist in our trailer home universe? Had they all quit Smallville and gone looking for bigger action? Save or be saved, these are questions. You want to think it's not over till the last page. It was a Wednesday this all happened, which supposedly is the bad one. Full of woe, etc. Add to that, coming out still inside the fetus Ziploc. But, according to Mrs. Peggett, there is one good piece of luck that comes with the baggy birth. It's this promise from God that you'll never drown. Specifically, you could still OD, or get pinned to the wheel and charbroiled in your driver's seat, or, for that matter, blow your own brains out. But the one place where you will not suck your last breath is underwater. Thank you, Jesus. I don't know if this is at all related, but I always had a thing for the ocean. Usually, kids will get fixated on naming every make and model of dinosaur or what have you. With me, it was whales and sharks. Even now, I probably think more than the normal about water, floating in it, just the color blue itself, and how for the fish... That blue is the whole deal. Air and noise and people and our all-important hectic nonsense. A minor irritant, if even that. I've not seen the real thing. Just pictures. And this hypnotizing screensaver of waves rearing up and spilling over on a library computer. So what do I know about ocean? Still yet to stand on its sandy beard and look it in the eye. Still waiting to meet the one big thing I know is not going to swallow me alive. Dead in the heart of Lee County, between the Rulin Coal Camp and a settlement people call Right Poor, the top of a road between two steep mountains is where our single wide was set. I wasted more hours up in those woods than you'd want to count, alongside of a boy named Maggot, wading the creek and turning over big rocks and being mighty. 
I could go different ways, but definitely a Marvel hero as preferable to DC, Wolverine being a favorite. Whereas Maggot tended to choose Storm, which is a girl. Excellent powers and a mutant, but still. Maggot was short for Matt Peggett, related obviously to the screaming lady at my birthday party, his grandmother. She was the reason Maggot and I got to be next-door neighbor wild boys for a time. But first, he'd need to get born, a little out ahead of me, plus getting pawned off on her while his mom took the extended vacay in Goochland Women's Prison. We've got story enough here to F up more than one young life, but it is a project. Famously, this place where we lived was known to be crawling with copperheads. People think they know a lot of things. Here's what I know. In the years I spent climbing around rocks in all the places a snake likes to lie, not one copperhead did we see. Snakes, yes, all the time. But snakes come in kinds. For one, a common spotty kind called a water devil that's easily pissed off and will strike fast if you make that mistake. But it's less of a bite than a dog deals out or a bee sting. Whenever a water snake gets you, you yell all the curse words you've got stored up in your little skull closet. Then wipe off the blood, pick up your stick, and go on being an adaptoid, thrashing on the mossy stump of evil. Where, if a copperhead gets you, that's the end of whatever you planned on doing that day, and maybe with that part of your hand or foot, period. So it matters a lot what you're looking at. If you care, you'll learn one thing from another. Anybody knows a sheepdog from a beagle or a whopper from a Big Mac. Meaning dogs matter and burgers matter, but a snake is a freaking snake. Our holler was full of copperheads, said the cashiers at the grocery whenever they saw our address on Mom's food stamps envelope. Said the school bus driver, day in, day out, snapping the door shut behind me like she's slamming it on their pointy snake faces. People love to believe in danger, as long as it's you in harm's way, and them saying bless your heart. Years would come and go before I got to the bottom of all the heart blessing, and it was not entirely about snakes. One of Mom's bad choices, which she learned to call them in rehab, and trust me there were many, was a guy called Copperhead. Supposedly he had the dark skin and light green eyes of a melungeon, and red hair that made you look twice. He wore it long and shiny as a penny, said my mother, who clearly had a bad case. A snake tattoo coiled around his right arm where he'd been bit twice, first in church, as a kid trying for manhood among his family's snake-handling men. Second time later on, far from the sight of God. Mom said he didn't need the tattoo for a reminder. That arm aggravated him to the end. He died the summer before I was born. My messed-up birthday surprised enough people to get the ambulance called, and then the monster truck mud rally of child services. But I doubt anybody was surprised to see me grow up with these eyes, this hair. I might as well have been born with the ink. Mom had her own version of the day I was born, which I never believed, considering she was passed out for the event. Not that I'm any witness, being a newborn infant plus inside a bag. But I knew Mrs. Peggett's story. And if you'd spent even a day in the company of her and my mom, you would know which of those two lotto tickets was going to pay out. Mom's was this. The day I was born, her baby daddy's mother turned up out of the blue. She was nobody mom had ever met nor wanted to, given what she'd heard about that family. Snake handling Baptist was not the half of it. These were said to be individuals that beat the tar out of each other, husbands belting wives, mothers beating kids with whatever object fell to hand, the Holy Bible itself not out of the question. I took Mom's word on that because you hear of such things, folks so godly as to pass around snakes, also passing around black eyes. If this is a new one on you, maybe you also think a dry county is a place where there's no liquor to be found. Southwest Virginia, we're one damn thing after another. Supposedly, by the time this lady showed up, Mom was pretty far gone with the pains. The labor thing coming at her out of nowhere that day. Thinking to dull the worst of it, she hit the Seagrams before noon, with enough white crosses to stay awake for more drinking, and some Vicodin after it's all a bit too much. Looks up to see a stranger's face pressed so hard against the bathroom window, her mouth looks like a butt crack. Mom's words take or leave the visual. The lady marches around through the front door and tears into Mom with a hell in the brimstone. 
What is she doing to this innocent lamb that Almighty God has put in her womb? She's come to take her dead son's only child from this den of vice and raise her up decent. Mom always swore that was the train I barely missed, getting whisked off to join some savage holy roller brood in open-ass Tennessee. Place name, my own touch. Mom refused to discuss my father's family at all, or even what killed him. Only that it was a bad accident at a place I was never to go called Devil's Bathtub. Keeping secrets from young ears only plants seeds in between them, and these grew in. My tiny head into grislier deaths than any I was supposed to be seeing on TV at that age. To the extent of me being terrified of bathtubs, which luckily we didn't have. The Peggots did, and I steered clear. But Mom stuck to her guns. All she would ever say about Mother Copperhead was that she was a gray-headed old hag, Betsy by name. I was disappointed, wishing for a black widow head of kick-ass red hair at the least. This being the only kin of my father's we were likely to see. When your parent clocks out before you clock in, you can spend way too much of your life staring into that black hole. But Mom saw enough. She lived in fear of losing custody and gave her all in rehab. I came out, Mom went in, and gave it a hundred percent. Gave and gave again over the years, getting to be an expert at rehab, like they say. Having done it so many times. You can see how Mom's story just stirred up the mud. Some lady shows up, or doesn't, offers me a better home, or not, then leaves after being called a string of juicy cuss words, knowing Mom, that would have left the lady's ears ringing. Did Mom make up her version to jerk me around? Was it true in her scrambled brain? Either way, she was clear about the lady coming to rescue a little girl. Not me. If this was Mom's fairy tale, why a girl? Was that what she really wanted? Some pink package that would make her get her act together? Like I wasn't breakable? The other part, a small thing, is that in this story, Mom never spoke my father's name. The woman is the Woodle Witch, that being my dad's last name, with no mention of the man that got her into the baby fix. She found plenty to say about him at other times, whenever love and all that was her last stop on the second six-pack. The adventures of him and her. But in this tale, as regards my existence, he is only the bad choice. Contents, too. My thinking here is to put everything in the order of how it happened, give or take certain intervals of a young man skunked out of his skull box, some dots duly connected. But damn, a kid is a terrible thing to be, in charge of nothing. If you get past that and groan, it's easiest to forget about the misery and pretend you knew all along what you were doing. Assuming you've ended up someplace you're proud to be, and if not, easier to forget the whole thing, period. So this is going to be option three, not proud, not forgetting. Not easy. I remember I always liked looking at things more than talking about them. I did have questions. My problem was people. Thinking kids are not enough full-fledged humans to give them straight answers. For instance, the peggots next door in their yard had a birdhouse on a pole that was a big mess of dangling gourds, with holes drilled for the bird doors. It was the bird version of these trailer pileups, you'll see, where some couple got a family going and nobody, not kids nor grandkids, ever moved out. They're just going to keep shacking up and hauling in another mobile home to set on blocks, keeping it one big family with their junk-ass porches and raggedy flag over the original unit. One nation underemployed. The Peggot birdhouse was that, a bird trailer clusterfuck. But no birds lived in it ever. There were bird nests galore in the trees behind the house, or they'd build one in some random place like under the hood of Mr. Peggot's truck. Why not move into a house already built, free of charge? Mr. Peggot said birds were like anybody. They like living their own way. He said he'd known government housing that didn't cost much more than a birdhouse to move into, just as unpopular. Fine, but why keep the thing up there, growing mold? Maggot told me Humvee had made it in shop. Humvee being one of Maggot's uncles, last seen near a schoolhouse around the time of the Bee Gees or Elvis. By now it's the 90s. The Peggots kept this reject birdhouse up its pole all those years for what? To remember their son Humvee by. I didn't buy it. 
the Peggots had seven kids altogether, living as far away as Ocala, Florida, or as close as a mile away. Cousins without number roamed through that house like packs of half-broke animals with meal privileges. Every family member got talked to or talked about on a daily basis, except two. One, Maggot's mom. Two, Humvee. One doing time in Goochland, one dead for undiscussed reasons. Besides the birdless birdhouse, they had a dog pen with no dog. Mr. Peggett used to run hounds before he got too tired for it like all the old men we knew, back whenever they still had the lungs for it, and dogs had foxes or bears to chase up a tree. In fall time, he'd take us to the woods to hunt ginseng or dig sassafras because those can't outrun you. But mainly just to be out there. He knew bird tunes the way people know who's on the radio. After we got old enough to handle a rifle, nine or ten, he showed us how to take a buck and how to heft up the carcass on the tree branch over the driveway to dress it out, letting loops of guts fall out steaming on the gravel. Mrs. Peggett cooked venison roast in the crock pot. You've not eaten till you've had that. The empty dog pen stood between our trailer and the Peggett house. Maggot and I would put a tarp over it and sleep out there, Usually, if falling trees someplace took out the lines and we couldn't watch TV. One summer, we did that for maybe a month, after a Nintendo Duck Hunt challenge where I accidentally let fly the controller gun and busted the screen. Maggot took credit for that deed so I wouldn't get sent home and skinned alive. Mrs. Peggett pretended to take his word for it, even though she heard the whole thing. Probably everybody has had some golden patch of life like that, where everything was going to be okay thanks to the people that had your back. And sadly, you wasted it by being ticked off over some ignorant thing like a busted TV. The Peggett house sat up at the top of the road with woods all around. They had chickens at one time, including this rooster with the mind of a serial killer that gave me bad dreams. But not farmers proper. Likewise, not the churchiest of people. But they were the ones that took me. Mom despised church, due to some of her fosters getting carried away with it. But I myself didn't mind. I liked looking at the singing women, and the rest you could sleep through. Plus that thing of being loved automatically, Jesus on your side. Not a faucet turned on or off like with people. But some of the Bible stories I minded definitely. The Lazarus deal got me mentally disturbed, thinking my dad could come back, and I needed to go find him. Mrs. Peggett told Mom I ought to go see Dad's grave in Tennessee, and they had a pretty huge fight. Maggot calmed me down by explaining Bible stories were a category of superhero comic. Not to be confused with real life. As a kid, you just accept different worlds with different rules, even between some houses and others. The Peggot home being a place where things got put where they went. Mr. Peggot would come home with the groceries and right away, in they'd go to the refrigerator. Maggot and I would get done having our World War III in the living room, and those Legos and crap got picked up before we went outside, or else hell would be paid. Not so at my house, where milk seemed like it had its own life to live and would sit out on the counter till it turned. Mom always said she'd lose her mind if it wasn't screwed in, and she wasn't wrong. Her work ID badge on the back of the toilet, makeup by the kitchen sink, purse outside under a chair. Shoes wherever. That was just Mom. In my room, I tried to keep stuff put away, mainly my action figures and the notebooks I kept for my drawings. I asked Mom one time how to fix the bed so it was covered up like you see them on TV, which she thought was dead hilarious. We kids roamed wide, sometimes as far as the old coal camps with the little row houses like Monopoly, except not all alike anymore due to idle mischief and the various ways a roof can cave in. We'd play King of the Hill on the tipple cones and come home with white eyelids and coal underscore black faces like old miners we'd seen in photo albums. Or we'd mess around in creeks. Not the unmentionable one of Devil's Bathtub, which freaked Mom out and anyway was over in Scott County. The best place by far was the little branch that ran right behind our houses as a place for a boy to turn invisible. Water with its own ideas, moving around under all those rocks. And underneath the water, a kind of mud that made you feel rich, leaf-smelling, thick, of a color that you wanted to eat. Peggot's Branch, it was called, the Peggot's being who had lived there longest. 
Their house was built by some previous pegget before any other houses were up there, whenever it was one big farm where they plowed their tobacco with mules. So said Mr. Pegget, mules being the only way you could farm on land that steep. On a tractor, you'd roll it and kill yourself. The trailer where Mom and I lived was technically a Peggett trailer, former home of Maggot's Aunt June before she moved to Knoxville. Mom rented it from the Peggetts, which was probably why they kept an eye and helped her out, like Mom was the second-string sub that came in off the bench after their own A-team daughter left the game. Maggot said June was still their favorite, even after she got her nursing degree and moved away, which is saying a lot. Most families would sooner forgive you for going to prison than for moving out of Lee County. To be clear, me and Mom were no kin of theirs, so this was not one of those family trailer pileups. Those shabby type of places show up on reality TV a lot more than reality in general. I think for the same reason people like to see copperheads where there aren't any copperheads. The Peggots just had their house and the one extra single wide. Nine or ten other families had their places up and down our road that were kept up very decent, and again, no relation. But the Peggots were a thundering horde, no question. I was jealous of Maggot for the wealth of cousins he totally took for granted. Even the hot older girl cousins that were all, Ooh, Maddie, I'd kill you for your eyelashes! No fair god wasted a face that pretty on a boy. Then squealing because maggots trying to give them arm burns. These buff cheerleader babes that honestly could kick his puny ass any day. There's no way they were scared. It was just this routine they had. The girls saying their girl shit to maggot. And him acting like he hates it. And I'd be like, really, man? Yes. I get that pretty is one of those words a guy has to treat like it's the clap and he's got his balls to protect. The whole manhood situation with Maggot being complicated, to put it mildly. But this would happen with nobody around to judge him, just the cousins. And me, the cousinless jerk that would have paid money for some girl making that kind of fuss over me, and lying halfway on top of me in a dog pile once they've all settled down on the living room floor to watch Walker, Texas Ranger. Me, the jerk sitting by himself on the couch looking at my friend down there in that pile, thinking, dude. Who hates being adored? I've been saying Mrs. Peggett this and that, so I'll go on writing it that way because the truth is embarrassing. I called her Mama. Maggot called her that, so I did too. I knew his cousins were not my cousins, nor was Mr. Peggett my grandpa. I called him Peg like everybody did. But I thought all kids got a Mama, along with a caseworker and free school lunch, and the canned beanie weenies they gave you in a bag to take home for weekends. Like assigned. Where else was I going to get one? No prospects in coming from mom, foster care, orphan dropout. And the mother of ghost dad, already discussed. So I got a share with Maggot. This seemed fine with Mrs. Peggett. Other than my official sleeping place being at mom's, and Maggot having his own room upstairs in the Peggett house, she played no favorites. Same hostess cakes, same cowboy shirts she made for us both with the fringe on the sleeves. Same little smack on the shoulder with her knuckles if you cussed or wore your ball cap to her table. Not to say she ever hit hard. But Christ Jesus, the tongue thrashings. To look at her, this small, granny-type individual with her short gray hair and mom jeans and flat yellow sandals, you're going to think, nothing at all here to stand in my way. The little do you know. If you're going to steal or trash-talk your betters, or break her tomato plants, or get caught huffing her hairspray out of a paper bag, the lady could scold the hair off your head. She was the only one to use my real name after everybody else let it go, Mom included. I didn't realize until pretty late in life, like my twenties, that in other places people stick with the names they start out with. Who knew? I mean Snoop Dogg, Naz, Scarface. These are not Mom underscore assigned names. I just assumed every place was like us up home in Lee County, where most guys get something else on them that sticks. Shorty or grub or checkout. It's a good guess Humvee was not Humvee to begin with. Mr. Peggett was Peg after he got his foot crushed by one of those bolting machines they use in the coal mines. 
Some name finds you, and you come running to it like a dog until the day you die, and it goes in the paper along with your official name that everybody's forgotten. I have looked at the obits page and thought about how most of these names are harsh. Who wants to die an old stubby? But in life, it's no big deal. You can buy a beer for your best friend Maggot without either one of you giving it a thought. So it was not usual for Mrs. Peggett to keep my born name in the mix after others had moved on from it. It's Damon. Last name of Fields. Same as Mom's. At the time of filling in the hospital forms after my action-packed birth, she evidently had her reasons for not tagging me to my dad. From what I know now, there's no question, but looking like him was something I had to grow into, along with getting hair. And in those days, with her look still being the main item in Mom's plus column and the words bad choice yet to join her vocab, maybe there were other candidates. None on hand to gentleman up and sign over his name. Or drive her home from the hospital. That job, like most gentlemen up stuff in Mom's life, fell to Mr. Pegg. Was he happy about it or not? Another story. As far as the Damon part, leave it to her to pop out a candy-ass boy band singer name like that. Did she think she'd even get me off her tits before people turned that into demon? Long before school age, I'd heard it all. Screamin' demon, demon semen. But once I got my copper underscore wire hair and some version of attitude, I started hearing little copperhead, hearing it a lot. And look, no red-blooded boy wants to be little anything. Advice to anybody with the plan of naming your kid Junior. Going through life as many you will be as thrilling as finding dried-up jizz on the carpet. But having a famous ghost dad puts a different light on it, and I can't say I hated being noticed in that way. Around the same time Maggot started his shoplifting experiments, I was starting to get known as Demon Copperhead. You can't deny it's got a power to it. Contents 3 from the day Merle Stone walked up our steps with his Davidson boot chains jingling, Mom was like, he's a good man. He likes you, and you like him. I had my instructions. Stoner is the name he went by, and if he said nice things to Mom, she was all ears. By now, she's been sober long enough to keep her Walmart job through all restocks of the seasonal aisles. Halloween costumes, Santa crap, Valentines, Easter candy, folding lawn chairs— She's up on the rent and has her drawer full of sobriety chips that she takes out late at night and looks over like a dragon sitting on its treasure. That much I remember. Mom getting home from work and into her cutoffs, cracking open a mellow yellow, sitting on our deck smoking with her feet up on the rail and her legs stretched out trying for the free version of a tan, yelling at Maggot and me down in the creek not to get our eyes put out from running with sticks. Life is great, in other words. What I don't remember is what I didn't know. How does it feel to turn legal drinking age and already be three years into AA? How much does it suck to have a school-age kid and a long underscore termed relationship with the Walmart party supplies aisle while the friends you used to have are still running around looking to get high or drunk or married? Ideally, some perfect combo of all three. All Mom had to work with were middle-aged type people in their 30s at least— sobriety buddies and Walmart buddies that would tell her, you have a blessed day, hun, and go home to their husbands and buckets of chicken and jeopardy. She tried and failed at more boyfriends by this time, post me getting born, which all dumped her because, A, they got her off the wagon and into hot legal water with motherhood, or B, she was no fun. Then along comes Stoner, claiming he respects a clean woman. Looking something like Mr. Clean himself, cue ball head, big biceps, gauges instead of the earring. Mom said he could grow hair if he wanted to, but liked shaving his head. To her mind, a ripped, bald guy in a denim vest and no shirt was the be-all, end-all of manhood. If you're surprised a mom would discuss boyfriend hotness with a kid still learning not to pick his nose, you've not seen the far end of lonely. Mom would light me a cigarette and we'd have our chats. Menthols, of course this being in her mind the child-friendly option. I thought smoking with mom and discussing various men's stud factors was a sign of deep respect. So I came to know such things, a whole head with a five o'clock shadow, dead sexy. But Stoner ran out of steam on his shaving at a certain point because he had a full beard, the biggest and blackest you'll see outside of a Vandal Savage comic. 
One of the above powerful figures has plagued the earth with misery since before all time. And one makes Mr. Clean's Clean Freak Spray that will take the mold off your crappy shower curtain and make it like new. According to Mom, Stoner was doctor number two. She started coming home from work and getting into more makeup instead of less, in case he showed. And he did, passing out compliments. Mom is gorgeous. She's killing him with it, prettier than two peaches. Me, he called his majesty. What is that supposed to mean for a kid that owes most of his growth so far to signing his mom's name on the snap free lunch forms? Stoner said my trouble was, I'd gotten used to being a mama's boy. If he caught me lying with my head on mom's lap while we watched TV, he'd say, Oh, look, the little king is on his throne. But he owned a late model Ford pickup and a Harley FXSTSB bad boy, both completely paid off. And that part of the stoner deal was hard to despise. He'd kick down the stand on the Harley and go inside to see mom. Cue for me and Maggot to spend the next solid hour touching that hog, looking at our own stupid faces in its chrome, daring each other up onto its seat. Fully believing if Stoner came outside at that moment, we'd get the electric chair. So the day he roared up and asked if I wanted a ride, just down to the highway and back, Christ on a crutch. Why wouldn't I? Maggot looked at me like, man, you have all the luck. Mom yelled down from the deck, you hang on to him, Stoner. I'll tar you if you get him hurt. My problem was no shoes. It was a Saturday, and we'd been doing target practice with Hammerhead Kelly. That was some form of Peggot cousin add-on by marriage, older than us. Quiet kid, Mr. Peggot's favorite to take deer hunting. He'd brought over an air rifle, with our creek being full of items to shoot at. Anyway, the point being I had to think where my shoes were. Maggot's house, probably. Mom seemed to think I needed them and said, go get them on, so I did. But not without Mrs. Peggot first grilling me about what was up. She was watching out her window. Mom had walked down to the road, and Stoner was bent over kissing her like he was trying to suck something out of her guts with a straw. And her a willing party to the crime. Mrs. Peggot gave me the advice that I would probably fall off that boy's motorcycle and crack my head wide open. And the worst of it is, he might drive off and leave you, she said. Jesus, as much as I'd wanted to climb on that Harley and tear down the road for all to see, now I couldn't stop picturing my head lying open like the halves of a walnut shell, neighbors all crowded around, stoner speeding off for the blue yonder. I mean, Mrs. Peggot was not one to blow smoke. The lady knew shit. What a boy's brains look like laid open— I had no idea of at the time, which now I do. It's high on a list of things I wish I could unsee. But my little mind had a brutal talent for pictures. I went outside and told Stoner my stomach hurt. Maggot would have sold his own nuts to go in my place, but being a true friend, he just told Hammerhead we should all go inside and play Game Boy till I felt better. Suit yourself, Stoner said. But it was how he said it, like, shoot yourself. Standing with his arm draped over Mom's shoulders like he'd already made the down payment. The day would come, though, for me to ride on that hog, crammed between him and Mom like the cheese of a sandwich, getting a better look than needed at his neck tattoos. Mom behind me with her yellow hair flying and her arms reaching around to hold on to Stoner's ripped abs. The neck tattoos ran quite a ways up onto his scalp. I wondered if those came before or after the idea of shaving his head. The dumb things a kid thinks about instead of the bigger questions, like, where's this joyride taking the three of us in the long run? The first time it was to prose pizza. Stoner ordered us an extra large with everything, a pitcher for himself, cokes for me and Mom. After we'd put a pretty good hurt on the pizza, Mom excused herself for a minute to the ladies. These two friends of Stoner's came over and sat down in our booth like it was no big deal. They were just taking the next shift. I didn't know these guys. In Lee County, they say you have to look hard for a face you've not seen before, which surely was true for Mom, who directed anybody that could walk to where the solo cups are kept on aisle 19. But it's different for a kid, where you stick closer to your own. I'd noticed these men looking Mom up and down, but I didn't see how they were part of our group. 
The one that slid in next to Stoner was pale and white-haired, with a lot of ink, including an extra eye on the middle of his throat. Don't ask me why that's a good idea. The one sitting by me reeked of axe spray and had the small type mustache and goat you'd normally see on the Devil and Iron Man. My brain with its kid obsession of superheroes and evil supervillains wandered off to how I would draw them. The inked one I would name Extra Eye, that could see your thoughts. The other was Hell Reeker, with the power of slaying you with his smell. They got in a conversation with Stoner. What's this one called? A little demon, huh? Demon Spawn, jokes I'd heard a million times. Then Reeker came up with Spawn of the Centerfold, and Extra Eye said, A fox is going to whelp her pup, Stoner. You're lucky it's just the one. And Stoner said he'd better watch it because some people are smarter than you think. Oh yeah, who's that? Extra Eye asked. I was curious too. There, Stoner told him, which was a letdown. I thought maybe he'd meant me. There who? They wanted to know. Stoner did a fast little wink. Mr. Grin's friend, you damn idiots. Mr. Barrett. Oh, I gotcha, Reeker said. Mr. Cross to bear. I already knew at my tender age a decent list of assholes, but none by the name of Bear. These guys laughed about him until Mom got back, which was taking forever. They got cups out of the dispenser and helped themselves to Stoner's beer and asked about his drilling project. If Stoner drilled wells, that was news to me. Stoner asked what they would do if they found a cherry Camaro they wanted to buy, but it came with a trailer on the back. To buy or just take for a hard run? Extra Eye wanted to know, and Reeker asked, How firm is the hitch man? All three of them laughing their asses off. I sat there sucking my coke down to the ice till my throat froze to a hard round hole, confused by all that was said. After school let out for summer, the Peggots offered to take me to Knoxville. They were going to see Maggot's Aunt June staying two weeks. She was a hospital nurse and doing well for herself, living in an apartment with a spare room. For a person not even married, that's a lot of space. My first question, is Knoxville near the ocean? Answer, wrong direction. I've mentioned I was a weird kid regarding the seeing the ocean thing. So that was a letdown. Virginia Beach wasn't out of the question, just to be clear. Not like Hawaii or California, impossible. Seven hours and a tank of gas gets you there, according to Mom's co-worker Linda that went for a week every summer with her husband and stayed in a condo. But the Peggots were going to see their daughter and letting me tag along so I should be polite about it. And really, the idea of going any place other than school, church, and Walmart was pretty exciting. Up to then, I hadn't. What about Mom was my next question. She'll be late to work if I'm not here to remind her to set the alarm, I told Mrs. Peggot. I had a lot of concerns, like finding her work shoes for her and her ID badge, and remembering to go to the grocery. Mrs. Peggot was not really getting the situation of me and Mom. Who would get her mellow yellows for her out of the fridge, and who would she talk to? Mrs. Peggot said I should go ask Mom myself, which I did. I was sure she would say no, but she lit up and started on how much fun that would be, me in Knoxville with the Peggots. Almost like, not surprised. The night before we left, I stuffed my pillowcase full of underwear and t-shirts and my notebook of superhero drawings, and slept in my clothes. In the morning, I was out on the deck an hour before they packed up their truck, which was a Dodge Ram Club cab with the fold-down back seats that face each other. Maggot and I would play slapjack and kick each other's scabby knees all the way to Knoxville. Mom sat out there with me waiting for the peggots to shine and the sun to come up over the mountains that threw their shade on us. Living in a holler, the sun gets around to you late in the day and leaves you early. Like much else you might want. In my years since, I've been amazed to see how much more daylight gets flung around in the flatter places. This and more still yet to be learned by an excited kid watching his pretty mom chain smoke and listen to the birds sing. She tried to pass the time by asking the bird names, which I'd told her before. I only knew some few. Mr. Pegg knew them all. Jenny Wren, Field Canary, Jory Bird. If we'd splash our armpits and faces in the sink instead of a real shower, he'd say we were taking a Jory bath. Which is what I did that morning, in my big hurry to leave Mom. 
It's all burned in my brain. How she kept thinking of things to remind me about. Act decent. Remember, please, and thank you, especially whenever they pay for stuff. And don't go poking around June's apartment. Things you'd need to tell a kid before he goes out of state. I told her to set the damn alarm clock, which made her laugh because I'd already stuck a note on the refrigerator. Set the damn alarm clock. She said she loved me a whole lot and not to forget about her, which was weird. Mom was not usually all that emotional. Finally, Mr. Pegg down at the road hollered, All right then, we're fixing to go. I started down the steps, but Mom tackled me with all of them watching, kissing on my neck until I was pretty much dead of embarrassment. And that was it, we left her. Mr. Pegg waved, but Mrs. Peggett just stared at her, making a long kind of face. I could still see it any time she turned around to ask us if we were buckled up and did we want any cookies yet. She wore that face well over the state line. Chapter 4 Knoxville had a surprise in store. A girl named Emmy Peggett that lived with Aunt June in her apartment, the daughter of Maggot's dead uncle Humvee, of the birdhouse. She was a skinny sixth grader with long brown hair, and this look to her, cold-blooded, carrying around at all times a Hello Kitty backpack that she looked ready to bludgeon you with, then towed around your head inside. Getting to the bottom of all that was going to take some time. Right away, we piled into Aunt June's Honda to take us all to lunch at Denny's, except Mr. Pegg that needed to put up his bum leg after the drive. Aunt June made us belt up, which was the first I'd seen of three functioning belts in a back seat. Emmy sat in the middle not talking to us, fishing hair scrunchies and whatever out of her backpack, making a show of not letting us see what else was in there, like it might be something too shocking for our young minds. Aunt June let us order anything we wanted, so it was like a birthday. We sat by the window and it was hard to concentrate, with everything going on out there. I might have been the only kid at school that hadn't been to a city before, other than a girl with no parents and epileptic by the name of Gola Ham. Other kids my age had mostly been to Knoxville because people have kin there. Now I was getting my eyes full. If something went by like a cop cruiser with a dog in back, or a tow truck pulling a crushed Mustang, I'd yell, Oh man, look at that! And Emmy would cut her eyes over at me like, So? People don't total their fucking cars where you come from? Aunt June was busy talking to Mrs. Peggett about her job. She had to go into work after lunch until the next morning, day and night shifts back to back. She talked about the long hours and what she saw in the ER, like a pregnant lady that came in gut-stabbed with her baby still inside. Which, if you think about it, would make a crushed Mustang not that big a deal. More ER stories were still to come, told to Maggot and me by Emmy after she got over herself and started speaking to us. It turns out, the worst shit people can think of to do to each other up home is also thought of and done in Knoxville. Probably more so. The thing about a city is, it's huge. Obviously, I'd seen City on TV because that's all they ever show, other than Animal Planet, so I was expecting something like Knoxville. Only I had the idea you'd go around a corner and you'd be out of it. Back to where you'd see mountains, cattle pastures, and things of that kind, alive. No dice. Whenever Aunt June took us out, we'd drive down 20 or 30 streets with buildings only. You couldn't see the end of it in any form. If you are one of the few that still hasn't been, let me tell you what a city is. A hot mess not easily escaped. Did Maggot already know about Emmy before we came? Yes. Everybody in his family knew, and so did my mom, which freaked me out. For some reason, the subject of dead Humvee having a daughter living with Aunt June was not to be mentioned back home, ever. Maggot said I could talk to Mom since she already knew, but not Stoner. I said I was pretty sure he and Mom would break up by the time we got back, so... Not a problem. This conversation was on our first night, with Emmy asleep. We'd stayed up watching Outer Limits, and finally she conked. Maggot crawled over and took her backpack out of her hands to make sure she was really asleep. So Aunt June's spare room was actually home to the Ice Maiden. She had to move out of it for her grandparents to use for our two weeks' visit. We kids slept in a giant nest we made in the living room out of pillows and sheets. We called it a fort, but Emmy corrected us that it was our ship. The SS blow it out your anus. 
Maggot suggested, which got him demoted. She had all these tiny, stupid dolls in tiny, stupid suitcases. And in Emmy's world, they had ranks. Lieutenant, private, etc. Maggot usually ended up below the entire suitcase doll militia, as something like dishwasher, whereas I was in the middle. We tried involving her dolls in robberies and murders, which she surprised us by being totally into. She said there was a place outside Knoxville called Body Farm, where they buried dead bodies and then dug them up after they'd rotted to study the scientific aspect of crimes. Fine, we played by her rules and slept in a pillow ship. I asked if she'd ever seen the ocean. Never and no thanks was her answer. She'd been to Undersea Wonders Aquarium in Gatlinburg, and the sharks terrified her. If you asked me, her building was scarier than any sharks. Like being trapped in a Duke Nukem Doom castle. A thousand other families living there, every front door opening into one hallway. Stairs going down past other hallways. Outside the main front door, a street full of cars and cars, people and people. There was no outside anywhere. I asked Emmy who all these other people were, and she said she had no idea, but you couldn't talk to them due to stranger danger. Doom Castle was normal to her. Supposedly, she had school friends with Nike Air Maxes, Furbies, etc., meaning cooler than us grimy fourth graders. But where were they? Nowhere. She couldn't see them all summer. They lived in other Doom Castles. There was no running wild here like we did at home, adults around or not. Ideally not. Emmy was not on her own for one second, due to all the unknown people and murder potential. After school, she went to a lame place where they did crafts until the moms showed up, with kids that were not at her level. Her words. On Aunt June's night shifts, because they kept that ER going around the clock, there was an old lady downstairs with two stink-eye cats, where Emmy went for sleep, breakfast, and TV watching, meaning one neighbor at least was not a criminal mind. Her cats, possibly. That was the life of Emmy. School, making crap out of popsicle sticks, sleep. Aunt June had days off coming and said we'd do stuff then. In the meantime, Mr. and Mrs. Peggett sat at the table with the lights shut off, not wanting to use up their daughter's electricity. Mr. Pegg didn't know the streets and there wasn't any yard. I mean none because I asked. I didn't believe the world would even have a place like this. Not just from the kid viewpoint of no place to mess around. Where would these people grow their tomatoes? The apartment itself was nice if you overlooked where it was. Classy like Aunt June, with her shiny fingernails and short brown hair like posh of the Spice Girls. Little freckles. Definitely hot, or so I'd have thought if I wasn't calling her Aunt June. Her furniture was a cut above what people usually have, matching. A fridge where ice and cold water came out the front, and a kitchen counter with stools. Bookshelves with books. One bathroom for everybody, and another one for Aunt June only, in her bedroom, with a tub. I was still scared of those somewhat, but didn't let on. She also had a closet with a shoe rack on the door. Twenty-one pairs of shoes. Actual count. On our first day, Emmy made a point of showing us all these special features of the place, which took maybe an hour. Then we were pretty much lost for stuff to do. Mrs. Peggett poked into June's closet and got to mending. She could mend anything at all to where you couldn't tell it was ever ripped, and made all Maggot's clothes, one of her powers. Mr. Pegg read the Knoxville News Sentinel, including obituaries of a thousand people he didn't know, and griped about having no place to go smoke then figured out to go downstairs on the sidewalk in front of the building with more people he didn't know, all smoking hard in a friendly way. Maggot and I took turns on his Game Boy while we waited for Aunt June to finish up saving people from their code blues and their GSWs. Or I drew in my notebook. I made one drawing of Aunt June in the bra-type outfit like she was Wonder Woman, with the superpower of what Aunt June actually did in real life. It would get so quiet we could hear people in the other apartments, or their TVs. A city is the weirdest, loneliest thing. Aunt June's bedroom closet was carpeted, the inside of a closet, if you can believe, and big enough for the three of us. We'd sit in the dark with stripes of light coming sideways through slits in the door, me and Maggot and the 21 pairs of shoes, hearing Emmy's ER stories. 
Some guy's cut off leg that got buried with the wrong body. Also Aunt June stories. Guys at Jonesville High that had wanted to screw her, but got kicked to the curb, even after one or more of them begged her to marry him. Same thing, different guys in nursing school. We kept waiting for the part about what happened to Emmy's parents, and why she's living with Aunt June, if the lady was so hot to get away from the would-be husbands and babies. No mention. Emmy had other concerns, like her secret stash under some loose carpet. The first time she went digging around, I saw the light-striped face of Maggot looking at me like, What the hell? And up she comes with flattened packs of cigarettes and gum. Asking did we want gum. We said okay. She said, How does it feel to want? We watched her peel the foil off one stick of gum very slowly. Watched her put it in her mouth, hypnotized by the weirdness of this chick. Drooling, even if we didn't want any in the first place. She pushed her hair back over her skinny shoulders. We smelled the fruity smell. Rude, Maggot said after a minute. She said, talk to the hand. Aunt June was the opposite of Emmy. She gave us our own special bowls for snacks we could eat any time we wanted. She finally got her days off and took us all over. A trampoline park, put-put golf, the hospital. The zoo, where we spent a whole day. Tigers, giraffes, and all like that. Monkeys which Maggot and I figured out how to get all riled up until Aunt June said knock it off or we were going straight home. She was extra nice, but the lady took no shit. It was a stinking hot day, which probably the animals were liking no more than us. The only happy campers were these small-sized penguins that slid down rocks into their not-so-clean pool over and over. I was like, hey, the life! I'd take it, penguin shit and all. I asked Aunt June if there was an ocean part of the zoo, which there wasn't. I might have asked a few times. Then she got this idea. She took hold of my ears and stood looking at me, like she had me by the handles. I know what you'd love, she said. In Gatlinburg, they had a giant aquarium place that was full-on ocean. Sharks and everything. I didn't mention Emmy already telling me about this place, that she was definitely not a fan of. Aunt June let go of my ear handles and said just as soon as she had more days off, we'd drive over there. And Emmy gave me this look like, you were warned, so don't cry when you wake up with your nuts ripped off. But we were going, sharks and all, even if Emmy was afraid. Every dog gets his day. Aunt June was working all hours, plus taking us places, and being a kid I gave it no real thought until one night she came in late, or early morning maybe. I was awake but didn't want to spook her by saying anything. Then after a while, it was too weird for her to know I was lying in the pillow pile watching her. She poured herself a glass of water and took off her white shoes and sat down at the table and just stared at the glass. Pulled both hands through her hair like she was combing it, exactly a thing Maggot did sometimes. She had his same eyes, the blue and the dark lashes that his girl cousins. wanted to kill him over. I'd never seen Maggot's mom, but now I thought about her being Aunt June's little sister. Those two playing together. Now here was one of them trying with all her might to put people back together, and the other in Goochland serving ten to twelve for trying to cut a person to pieces, damn near with success. Aunt June stretched her legs out under the table and leaned back in the chair and stayed that way for so long I thought she must have fallen asleep but she hadn't. After a while, I could hear her letting her breath out, long and quiet like an air mattress with a slow leak. It was unbelievable how much she had to let out. It went on forever. The aquarium turned out to be the best day of my life. If I ever get to see the real ocean and it turns out better than undersea wonders in Gatlinburg, I'll be amazed. You name it, they had it. Seahorses, octopus, jellyfish that swam upside down. Shallow tanks you could reach in and touch stuff. The main attraction was the shark tunnel, where you walked under a giant tank with the bigger individuals. Sharks, rays, turtles. But turtles the size of a Honda. A sawfish, which is like a shark, except sticking out of its face is something like a chainsaw. I kid you not. Mrs. Peggett came with us that day. 
One or the other always had to stay behind so the rest of us could fit in the car. If Mr. Pegg stayed, he'd fix something. Or Mrs. Peggett would stay and have supper ready for us, which made Aunt June homesick. On the Gatlinburg day, Mrs. Peggett and Aunt June never stopped talking, even though there was amazing shit they should have been paying attention to, such as a sawfish. Also, she'd paid some crazy amount of money, like a hundred dollars, to get us in. But we were leaving soon, and I guess Mom and Daughter still had ground to cover. Such as how hard June worked, which Mrs. Peggett was opposed to, and something about her rotation or moving to a different hospital. A guy named Kent she was thinking of going out with, that she called a drug rep, which I figured must not be the same as a dealer, Aunt June being all on the up and up. None of it, of course, any of my business. We saved the shark tunnel for last because it was best, and because Aunt June and Emmy were in mortal combat all week over whether Emmy was going in there. She started out refusing to go to Gatlinburg, period. Her next failed plan was to stay in the car while we all went in. Aunt June had this way of being dead calm, but it's her way or the highway. You could see her in the ER saying, I'm sorry about the bullet holes in you, sir, but I've got a job to do here. Long story short, Emmy was going in the damn shark tunnel. Aunt June said she'd been too young that first time, but she needed to get back on the horse and see there was nothing to fear. So in we went, Aunt June ignoring Emmy, while Maggot and I got our minds blown by a million tons of water over us with huge things swimming in it. The floor itself moved. I was not expecting that. Pulled by our own shoes into the briny deep. I turned around to see what Emmy thought, and holy Moses. The girl was dead frozen. People with their strollers and drinks jostling around her to get into this thing they paid good money for, and Emmy scared out of her mind. I didn't really think, just headed back. But the floor was moving, so I was going nowhere, somewhat like a dream in how it felt like time was not time. Her scared eyes watching me. I shoved through the people all looking up at sea creatures, basically Aquaman and the Lagoon of Atlantis, until I was on solid ground with Emmy hanging on me like a true drowning person. It's okay, I told her. We weren't going to go off and leave you. She did, though. She didn't even look back. She wouldn't have left the building. She was coming back for you after the tunnel. Emmy was shivering. She didn't act like it. She was, I said. Aunt June is perfect like that. She keeps track. I figured on having to wait with her till the others came back, then hearing about the Gatlinburg fucking shark tunnel from Maggot for the rest of my natural life. But for whatever reason, Emmy said, okay, let's do it. I had to hold her hand. She kept her eyes closed. It was true about Aunt June keeping track, which was not true of my mom in any way, shape, or form. So that was me promising Emmy that life is to be trusted. I knew better. I should have let her go with her gut. Never get back on the horse, because it's going to throw you every damn chance it gets. Then maybe she'd have been wise to the shit that came for her later on, and maybe it would have turned out better. Which is me saying too much for now. Sorry. Aunt June gave us all five dollars to spend in the gift shop. Maggot bought a plastic hammerhead shark, Emmy got rock candy, and everybody was waiting. On snap decision, I bought this thing for Emmy, a little silver bracelet with a snake as part of it. The package said moray eel, whatever. I gave it to her while we were walking to the car. I said probably she hated snakes, but it was like her bravery badge. She just said thanks. Then on the drive home, she mentioned she was in love with me, and we would get married whenever we got old enough. Okay, I said. I was pretty much used to the chain of command by then. But to tell the truth, kind of shocked. I asked her, why me? Why not Maggot? And she said, duh, Maddie's my cousin. That gave me the usual sting of not having my own cousins. But I hadn't considered there being a plus side, like Emmy eligible to be in love with me. I told her I didn't know how. She said, no worries. It was easy. She did it all the time with boys at school and the popsicle stick place. Maggot said that just proved she was a slut. I think he was feeling left out. The day we packed up to go home, Emmy pounced with all these instructions. I was to talk Mom into letting me call her. This being the 90s, no Facebook, no texting. 
Emmy said if I didn't call, she'd drop me and be in love with somebody else. Might as well learn that one early, I'm going to say. But I hadn't thought much about Mom since we left. Even though she was all, don't forget me, which I thought was stupid. Who forgets his mom? But yet I had. I made up for it by thinking about her a lot on the way home. It's two hours, but we stopped for gas and cokes at Cumberland Gap and at the park where they have the bison. Mr. Pegg was the slowest driver imaginable. Finally, we chugged up the driveway at a mind-shattering five miles an hour, and I was ready to open the door and roll out before he got to a stop. But Mrs. Peggett turned around and laid a hand on my arm while the others got out. She said she had something she was supposed to tell me. She was nervous, which I didn't like one bit. Well, you're not going to tell me she's dead because I can see her, I said. Mom must have heard the truck because she'd come outside. She was up there waiting on the deck. No, nobody's dead. It's good news, Mrs. Peggett said. You've got a daddy. And he's dead, I said. Even though trying to be respectful. Well, no, he isn't. Not the one I'm telling you about. I thought about the grave where he was buried, which had been much discussed as regards my seeing it, and I blurted out, Lazarus isn't real! She gave me a funny look. No, not him. A new one. Now I've told you, so go on. I didn't understand. Even after I was up on the deck getting attacked by Mom's hugs and kisses. Then Stoner came out of the house. For a split second, I wondered what he would think of me having a new dad, and then I got it. Chapter 5 In the two weeks I was gone, Mom did these things. 1. Got married to Stoner. 2. Took off work for a weekend honeymoon to Luray Caverns. 3. Moved the furniture around. My bedroom was the bigger one, and now according to Mom we had to swap, because it was her and Stoner versus one of me. She said we'd get a better house pretty soon because Stoner made a good living. I walked around my house that wasn't my house, while Stoner, with his boots up on the coffee table, paged through his American iron, not even in a shirt, just his wife beater. Like it's his kingdom now and he's got nobody to impress. In my room that wasn't my room, the bed was under the window where I hated it, and my action heroes were put on their shelf in the stupidest way imaginable, the reds together, greens with greens, nothing to do with their actual alliances or powers. It looked like some brainless ghost kid had been locked in here while I was gone, lining up his stuff in meaningless ways. Also, maggots in my fort had a dog in it now. Like Vandal Savage's beard, huge and black with hate in its eyes. It barked and flung itself at the chain link any time you got close. School was starting in a few weeks, and for the first time ever, I wanted summer over with. Who knew that was possible? Meantime, I spent all hours over at Maggot's, telling him how lucky he was not to have parents he had to live with, Maggot being in total agreement. From his room upstairs, we'd watch Stoner at the dog pen having his sessions with Satan. In case you thought I was being a crybaby, asshole names his dog Satan. Trains it to the path of murder using raw steak, shaking it, yanking it away. Dog is going full ape shit. Stoner getting off on that. Mother H, fuck, you better stay over here till that dog rips out the master's lungs, was Maggot's advice, not at all needed. That was my plan for the rest of the summer. After that, my time there would be limited to the after-school hours. I assumed the Peggots would be on board. Who was not on board was Mom. She started asking questions. Were the Peggots trying to turn me against Stoner? No trying needed job well done by the man himself, I told Mom. She smacked me for having a smart mouth. But that was by no means the end of it. She acted like the neighbor's opinions of her new husband mattered more than mine. Or hers either. Finally, I got mad and told her what Mrs. Peggett had said one time, about Stoner not caring if I fell off the back of his Harley and busted my brains. Mom got this wide-eyed look and said I was not to go back over there the rest of the week. Mom was a small person, tiny really, which according to Mrs. Peggett was from Mom having me before she was done growing herself. The upshot of this being, by age ten I was catching up to her, height-wise, and had started on certain occasions to tell her, try and stop me. This was one of those occasions. 
This time her answer was maybe she couldn't, but Stoner sure as hell could. And maybe that's what she needed a husband for, if I was wondering. We were, in other words, turning into a domestic shit show. I was too mad to care, but I think Mom was having her doubts. With Stoner always grilling her on why she dressed like a whore, who was she flirting with at work? Where did she go afterwards? Which was nowhere. He didn't even like her going to her AA and NA meetings because it was mostly men. He passed up no occasion to remind her she was married now, so there'd be no more playing the field. So maybe Mom's pep talks were as much for her benefit as for mine. How lucky we were, because Stoner had a good job. Not a point to be argued in Lee County, I'll grant you. The business he worked for was picking up. He'd be making good money. We would be safe. This job that made Stoner the second coming of Jesus? A CDL driver. Meaning he drove a semi with a special license so he could drive not just ordinary everyday shit around in his truck, but beer. Or a Stoner called it product. Distribution truck driver for Anheuser-Busch. He had to pass an annual test proving he could lift and move product, weighing up to 165 pounds. All this and much more I never wanted to know, he told me while lying on the floor pressing his X-mark free weights that had moved in along with certain bad smells and Satan. The weights took up most of the living room, all the more so if he was lying among them in his sweaty undershirt and leather bracelet, neck veins ready to pop, grunting on each press like he's taking a shit, rotating and merchandising beverages at more than 50 customer accounts, he says, like he's a professor of whatever the hell, driving the routes to completion regardless of road conditions. Medical and dental was the part that got Mom excited, I would have coverage now in case I needed my tonsils out or got hit by a car. Or the ADHD drugs that some teachers had been wanting Mom to put me on from day one. Stoner said, oh yes, the riddling or whatever would take me down a notch. Mom was on the fence. But she said definitely I was going to the dentist now, whether needed or not. Which I wasn't thrilled about. I'd heard kids say it was like a torture chamber, and I'd heard others say it wasn't that bad. The dentist. I'd never been. Soon I found out that teeth drilling was the best of what I could expect now. A whole new life for young demon was Stoner's plan, described to me one morning at breakfast after Mom left for work. I was going to learn self-discipline, like they teach you in the Army. Not that Stoner had done military service, mind you. I reckon he saw the movie. My mom has been too lenient with me, says Stoner, leaning over to take another slurp of his Cheerios and milk, and I'm thinking how much he eats like a dog even the red plastic bowl he's eating from, how that could be a dog bowl. My mother has been letting me get away with Tood. Now I'm going to learn how righteous people live, with discipline and respect for others. I have nothing to say to this. Stoner reaches forward lightning fast and decks me in the jaw. My spoon flies out of my hand onto the floor. One ear is ringing, my cheek burns. I stare at him. What did I do? Arrogant little piece of shit. It's not what you did, it's what you were thinking. What was I thinking? That stoner ate his breakfast like a dog. A dog with gauges in its ears. That I'd like to clip a leash in one of those holes and take him for a hell of a walk. Here's the thing, stoner explains calmly, like nothing just happened. Wiping milk out of his beard with the back of his wrist, scratching his tattooed head. He says it's no surprise, me being so screwed up. How would mom know how to raise a kid? She grew up in foster care. It's inevitable she's going to raise up another total loser. And I'm thinking if he just called mom a total loser, then he married her why exactly? Losing track of where he's going with this chat about how lucky we are, mom and me. That stoner came along to get us both straightened out. I sit with my fists on the table, cereal bowl between them, my red-haired head still on my neck. Stoner finishes dog slurping his cereal. I don't blink. I don't move. I've seen the army movie, too. The milk in my bowl can go sour. Day can turn to night. It's nothing to me. I stay. Stoner shoves back his chair, throws his bowl in the sink, and goes out. The screen bangs shut. Then I pick up my spoon off the floor and eat my cereal. That's the win I get if there is one. Filling up like a bowl under a dripping faucet. Filling with hate while I wait the man out. I told Mrs. Peggett about Stoner, and she said she'd have to talk to Mom, either that or call DSS. 
I picked Mom. So they had their talk. I could tell Mom was hurt at Stoner. Maybe she didn't realize how bad it was getting as regards the man-to-man -man shit. She tried pushing back on him some. One night she brought home a pizza, and while we were eating in the living room with the TV on, she used this bright, birdy little voice to say she still had opinions about things and ought to be able to say them in her own house. It was during a commercial. About what was Stoner's question, and her answer was me, that I was still her son. Stoner said nothing. The show came back on, which was law and order, and I didn't want to eat anymore. The pizza was a Hawaiian from Pro's with the ham and pineapple, my favorite, which Mom, of course, knew, and Stoner didn't. This pizza was like a message in code from Mom to me, meaning, don't give up the ship, I'm still on it with you. But now with Stoner going quiet and all brutal in his eyes, I felt like I'd be lucky to keep down what I'd eaten so far. The show ended. Stoner got up and turned off the TV and sat back down facing Mom. I see he said. Because drunks and pillheads are so good at taking care of their kids. Mom's eyes went to mine. The house is on fire, is what they said, and I'm so sorry about it that I could die. I knew she was sorry. We'd been over it a hundred times. That's step nine, apologizing to all the people you've hurt. That and the higher power, the moral inventory, the practicing of the principles. We'd been through it all. She'd tried, and to be fair, I guess she was trying still. Mom is sober, I said. She got sober so she could keep me. And who the hell asked you? He leaned over the coffee table and closed the pizza box and slid it away from where I was sitting on the floor. Like I was an animal he was training that had just lost my privileges. He turned back to Mom. You love your kids so much, you let the neighbors fucking raise him. Even though we've discussed this, I have talked, and you have not listened. He's still over at the damn Peggots more than he's in his own house. Am I wrong? No, Mom said. No, I am not. You sit here turning a blind eye while he runs around with that little queer next door, with the jailbird mother. Am I wrong? Mom said nothing. The little queer's whore mother that is in the pen for shanking her goddamn boyfriend. Stoner leaned over close to Mom and yelled, Am I fucking wrong? She nodded, then shook her head. Confused due to being terrified. He turned to me. Is that your plan, demon? To grow up and be a fag? I don't have a plan, I said. I couldn't even believe this conversation was happening. No? You're not thinking you'll find yourself a boyfriend and then shank him and wind up getting gangbanged in prison? Is that the kind of people we are in this family? I wondered how Stoner would feel about getting vomit for an answer, because that's where I was headed. But he didn't care. He turned back to yell at Mom. I was starting to run low on sorry for Mom by that point. Marrying the asshole was not my idea. Tell him! Stoner yelled at her. Right now, so we can all hear it. He's not going back over there to play with the queer. Not tomorrow and not ever. Or there will be consequences. She said it, and I didn't see forgiving her for it. I hardly went outside again until school started. It rained the whole week, which made it feel that much more like detention. I watched a thousand reruns of X-Men, Iron Man, Exasquad, Spawn, and Hulk. Whenever Stoner wanted the TV, I went in my room and read them in the comics versions. I drew pictures in my notebook of Stoner as a supervillain getting crushed in various ways. At some point, the shows, comic books, drawings, and my dreams all got mashed up, so it was like there wasn't any me anymore. Just a quiet boy that looked like me with a beast inside, waiting to burst in a gamma warrior rage explosion. What I said about people, that if they care, they can tell one kind of a thing from another? Big if. Possibly the biggest if on the planet of Earth. Why notice zero on snakes, and a thousand percent on certain things about people? You don't know me or Maggot. If you saw the two of us, let's say, in second grade, you'd see two of a kind. Two white boys, more or less. My dead father being Melungeon, which passes generally for white, mixed with my little blondie mom. So I'm not as white as some, but enough to say so. 
two little rascals then, in Walmart tennis shoes and dirty fingernails. If you're from the city, I guess you'd say a couple of little hillbillies. Matched pair. Now I'm going to jump ahead, which is breaking my promise, but just for a minute. Ninth grade. I've got a lot of growth on me and a tiny red mustache. Maggot has grown his hair to his shoulders and started stealing eyeliner and nail polish from his cousins. Worst case, Walgreens. He's got spending cash, but a boy can't walk in and buy those things. Because he aims to use them. To switch out the tennis shoes also. Mrs. Peggett's homemade clothes we had turned against hard. No thank you on the fringe cowboy shirts. But now Maggot's tastes have started circling back around to the eye-catching. Now take a look at us. A straight boy and a queer. No matter who you are, whatever else you might say, good for him, or I want to kick his face in, or even I don't give a damn, you still saw what you saw. A boy and a queer. The eye sees what it cares enough to see. Even though I'm exactly the same kid I was, and so is Maggot. He was always the same Maggot. It was me that started calling him that. We were little, and it was hilarious. And it was me that kept it up. Because Maddie Peggett goes to school, and what is he going to be there but Maddie Faggot? I tried to make an end run around that one. I can't say the other names never got called, they did. But apart from that night with Stoner, they weren't said where I could hear them. I wasn't clueless to people's thinking. But a thing grows teeth once it's put into words. Now I felt that worm digging, spitting poison in my brain, trying to change how I saw Maggot. How I felt about people seeing the two of us together. Up to then, I was a casual collector of reasons to hate Stoner. That night a fire got lit. For what he'd done to my head, I would burn the man down.